Hello and welcome to the session in which we will discuss various retirement plans. Now the US Congress has implemented various incentives to encourage individuals, people like you and I, to save for retirement through some sort of a retirement plans. What type of incentives can the US Congress give? Tax incentive. You save, we're gonna give you some, if you save for your retirement, we're gonna give you some tax incentive. Now this tax incentive would they will give it to the employee to save as well as for the employer and simply put if you're self-employed as well. So what I'm going to start with, just discussing some basic concept, some basic terms you need to be familiar with that applies to all retirement plans, such as tax deferred account. When we say tax deferred account, what does that mean? It means that the money to be taxed later. It means it's going to grow tax free. So you put this money now in your retirement account and it's going to grow it's going to earn interest it's going to earn dividend it's going to have capital appreciation tax free sometimes the amount invested is not taxed simply put the amount that you invest today the original amount that you're putting away today that amount is not taxed so it's called pre-taxed amount and that amount since it's a pre-tax you did not pay taxes on it you're gonna get some sort of a savings today. So if you put, if you earned $3,000 and that money, and you put this money in a savings account, not savings, let's call it retirement account, whatever that, let's, let's assume 401k, which is a form of a retirement account. If this money is not taxed, and let's assume your tax rate is 30%, immediately you saved $900 on your taxes. So you have to understand, sometimes the money that you invest in those retirement plan is not taxed. It means you have a savings today. Sometimes the money invested is already taxed. So let's assume you earned $3,000. Here's what's going to happen. You're going to pay $900 in taxes. What's left is $2,100. This $2,100, then you put this money in your in your in some sort of a retirement account. I'm not gonna call it 401k because when it comes to 401k, the assumption is it's a pre-tax. You put this money in a retirement plan. This money is already taxed. So the 2,100 is already taxed. This is called the post-tax money. So you have no savings for today. So you have to be careful whether the money is not taxed or pre-taxed money or not pre-taxed money. If it's not taxed, it means it's a pre-tax. It hasn't been taxed yet. If it's taxed, it's called it post-tax. Now, what's going to happen, that's going to make a difference when you get this money out. Here's what's going to happen. Rule of thumb, usually, generally speaking, money invested and earnings under option one, which is, it's already been, you, you did, the money was pre-taxed, it wasn't taxed, is fully taxable. So, if you invested money and that money is not taxed before. So let's assume, go back to that $3,000 that you put it away and you saved $900 today because it was not taxed. When you get that money out, that, that $3,000 plus any earnings and the earnings on that 3,000, maybe this 3,000 became a million. I don't know, you made a good investment. It's fully taxable. Money invested under tax two, uh, under option two, not tax two, it means it's a post-tax money. Generally speaking, you you get it out tax-free. Why? Because the original money was taxed and the earnings, if you meet certain qualification, it's going to be tax-free. The earning, it depends. So if it's a Roth IRA, which we'll talk about that later, if you invest this money in a Roth IRA and you qualify, everything is tax-free. Okay? Otherwise, it's going to be mostly taxable. So the point is, if the money is already taxed, the original money is already taxed, that's fine. You already pay taxes on it. When you get it out, it's tax-free, the original amount. Certain, under certain plans, you're going to have the money already taxed, and sometimes the money taxed and the earnings, they're both tax-free. But it's, it's all going to depend, but keep that in mind as we are going to be discussing the various retirement plans. Before we proceed any further, I have a public announcement about my company, farhatlectures.com. 
Four Hat Accounting Lectures is a supplemental educational tool that's gonna help you with your CPA exam preparation as well as your accounting courses. My CPA material is aligned with your CPA review course such as Becker, Roger, Wiley, Gleam, Miles. My accounting courses are aligned with your accounting courses broken down by chapter and topics. My resources consist of lectures, multiple choice questions, true-false questions, as well as exercises. Go ahead, start your free trial today. There are many types of retirement plans and basically we, they can be broken down into employer-sponsored plan. What does that mean? It means the company, it's a sponsored by the company. And this include people who are self-employed, self-employed, they are the company themselves. And we have individual sponsored plans like IRA, individual retirement account, which we'll talk about in the next session. In this session, we're gonna be focusing on the employer sponsored plan and those include qualified pension or simply pension you know it by pension profit sharing plan 401k or 403b we'll talk about those kiosk plan sep and simple plan so basically you know you, you know if you if you follow my lectures once i have a list it means i'm going to go over each item on this list starting with qualified pension what is a qualified pension when you think of qualified pension it's a good thing like if you really can get can get into a pension it's a good thing actually i have a funny story about a pension because i was enrolled into a pension without even me knowing uh, I was enrolled into a pension. So I'll tell you the story since I mentioned it. I was not planning to do so. So, you know, as a, as, 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 a, as a university instructor, you will teach at different universities as adjuncts sometimes. So one time I was teaching at a state university in Pennsylvania. State university. I was just teaching, I believe, one or two courses. It doesn't matter. No, I believe it was two courses. And as a result, if you teach at that university two courses or more, you will be enrolled automatically in their pension. Now, as an adjunct, you sign a lot of papers at the beginning. Okay, you are enrolled in our retirement plan. I did not really pay any attention to it because it's an adjunct position. That's I don't get my benefit from my adjunct position, my part-time position. So I signed my paperwork and I forgot about it. Two to three years later, I was hired by a community college in Pennsylvania and, well, Philadelphia, the community college of Philadelphia. And and uh, they asked me to fill out my paperwork. Now I have to be very careful. This is my full-time job. So I, I gotta make sure I, I know what I'm, uh, I, I read what I'm signing. So they had a 401, 403B, to be more specific. They don't, and we're gonna talk about what does that mean. They don't have 401K for educators. And they had a pension. And guess what? I said, well, they told me, yes, we have a pension, but it's only for people who've been in the, in, in the system for a long period of time. So the pension has been discontinued. So that's, that's, that's fine. So I filled out my paper for 403B or 401K, which is the equivalent of 401K. Two days later, I get a phone call from the school saying, you do have a pension. I was like, that's not possible. I don't have a pension. And I just started working at your community college. Said, oh yes, you were enrolled in the state system when you work at that other university and they enrolled you and you are grandfather into the system. So it's great. So now I have a pension. <laughs> this is how I got a pension without even me knowing I had a pension, which is good. So simply put, if you're a new hiree, you don't get a pension unless you are grandfather into another state pension plan. So simply put, the Community College of Philadelphia used to be part of the state pension plan. And I happen to be lucky that I worked, I taught those two classes at East Stroudsburg University and they enrolled me and I didn't pay attention because you know, I thought it's a small amount anyway, but it gave me a benefit. So that's good. So simply put, when I retire, if I if I stayed into the into the state system and meet all the requirement, I will have a guarantee income once I retire. So once I vest. Who gets those qualified pension? Like if you're a police officer, firefighters, usually government employees, what happen is they don't make a lot of money now. So they make it, you know, they make a living salaries, but they don't make a lot of money. Like if you work in a corporation where you get bonuses and raises, you don't make a lot of money, but you are enrolled in a pension. As a result, when you retire, you are guaranteed a certain amount. What about the other people? We'll talk about the other people in corporations. Now, back in the old days, most companies had pension, but pensions are very expensive because you have to set money away for your employees into the future. So you have to set that money with a trustee. You don't hold the money. Now, why would you set this money with the trustee? Think about it. Well, yeah, the company could go, could go out of business. And when they go out of business, you know, then they cannot pay the retirees that work for them. Or if they get sued, you don't want the person that sued the company have access to that, uh, to that fund. Therefore, the government require companies to set 
to set that money with a trustee. Now, how much will you get? Well, it all depends on how many years you put in. For example, at my community college, if you serve 10 years, you have what's called half a pension. If you serve 20 years, you have a full pension. So this, the, but each company is different. Each plan is different. And what was your salary the last three or five or seven years? Other factors play a role as well. But this is basically what a pension is. So, but the pension has to meet strict requirements. The company that's having a pension has to meet strict requirements. What are those requirements? Now, when I say qualified pension must meet strict requirements, for most the other plans, they also have to meet those requirements. So I'm not going to go, I'm going to, I'm not going to, be repeating myself, but I'm going to give you the gist, the idea here. First, the pension plan cannot highly favor compensated employees. So simply put, you cannot have a pension plan for the top-notch individual and the other employees, low-level employees, don't get to participate. You cannot form the, pen the benefit to only uh, benefit certain group of people. For example, the owners of the company and their families. You can't do that, okay? For example, 5% or more of the owners cannot have special benefit from this qualified pension plan. You have to have a vesting period. You have to tell your employees after two, five, seven, whatever years, you vest, you are fully vested. And the plan must benefit at least 70% of those employees who are not highly compensated. So the low level employees, it has to benefit at least 70% of them. If not all of them, but at least 70% has to participate. So it's a qualified pension. Now, why do you want it to be a qualified pension plan? Well, because it's going to give you tax benefit actually for both employers and employees. For the company, it's going to give them immediate tax benefit for the contribution. You make a contribution, you get, you get a tax deduction. Not bad. Expenses are good in taxes. The employer contribution are not wages. That's also good for employers. Simply put, they are compensating you for the future, nevertheless, but they don't have to worry about social security tax. They don't have to worry about Medicare tax. They don't have to worry about food and soda for those wages, in quote wages. Simply put, they're putting money away for you into the future. They can give it to you now, but guess what? They decide, you know what? To, to incite you to work for us, we're gonna have what's called a pension plan. OK, and, and earnings are tax deferred. So for you, it's a good thing, because if you get the money, you're going to be taxed on it. So the earnings are you remember the third. It means they're going to be taxed later. Earnings are tax deferred, tax later. And it's not taxable until I take them out. And when I take them out, when I take the money out, when I'm 59 and a half, then I have the ability to pay. So now no problem. I'll have to pay the money. OK, so this is why it's important that, that you have you qualify under a pension plan and the qualified pension plan. They could be con non contributory or contributory. What does that mean? Contributory means you, the employee, myself, I contribute. And for example, my pension plan, I do contribute. Our pension plan is contributory. I have to pay a certain amount. They pay. They will pay the rest. But my outcome is guaranteed. And this is important. Or some pension plan, they're non contributory. For example, my wife worked with at J and J, Johnson and Johnson. They also have a pension plan, but their pension plan is non contributory. She doesn't have to put money away in her plan. They they fund the company finance. They put money away on your behalf. You don't have to put any money from your paycheck. Also the qualified plan might be either a defined contribution. Defined contribution means you know what you are contributing, but you don't know what you are receiving. Okay? So Certain clients say so we're going to put money this much away, but we don't know what the outcome will be. And we're going to see what, what those plans are in a moment. Other plans, the traditional pension plans, are defined benefit. So the benefit are defined. The benefit are spelled out. For example, my pension plan, I don't know the details of it because as my salary changes, the benefit will change. But they will tell you, they will specifically tell you, uh, the amount of the money you're going to be getting down the road. So they are less risky plans, less risky plans. Now, the profit sharing plan is basically a defined contribution. OK, so which is defined contribution plan, a defined contribution plan. So it's a form of pension plan, but it's a defined contribution. So first of all, it's profit sharing. Think about it. Well, we're going to put money away from the profit. So what happened if we don't make a profit? Well, we can put money away. So the first thing you need to know, it is discretionary by the company. OK, the company decide whether they want to contribute to the plan or not contribute to the plan. For example, it's if we have no profit, we're not going to contribute. And these these type of pension plan are good for small companies, but it gives them some flexibility. They're not under the obligation to to put money away every year. So the employee performance of the company, what happened is now you tie the employee performance to the company. You encourage the employee to work hard. Okay, It's a form of 
defined contribution. The profit, because you were maybe you were thinking a minute ago, what does he mean by defined contribution? It means you know how much you're putting, but you really don't know what's coming out because it's going to fluctuate. You don't know how much you're putting every year. Okay, an employee don't make any contribution because it's from the profit. That's the idea of it. So some companies, what they do, they would say you have two options. If you don't want to participate, you'll get your money now. What's called the cash out. Guess what? If you get your cash out, it's taxable, but you get your money now, or you can put your money away. And what happens if you leave the company? You can roll it over into an IRA. Don't worry about this term. We'll discuss that. Roll over in the next session. Simply put, you can transfer it, but you need to know the rules for that. We'll discuss it. Okay. And companies, what they would do, they would have some companies, most companies will have a 401k on the side because of, you know, the profit sharing plan. What happens if the company is not making profit? Well, you can, can you can participate in the 401k. Well, what is 401k then? Well, that's another retirement plan. The reason it's called 401k because of the IRS section, the it's under that section, um, Internal Revenue Code section 401k. It's a qualified technically profit sharing because you can take your money now if you don't want to participate or you can put your money away for retirement to grow tax free. The contribution for the 401k is pre-tax dollar, which is good. It means if you contribute $10,000 per year and your tax rate is 20%, you shielded $10,000 from taxes. Those are not taxed if you put them away. As a result, you saved $2,000 in taxes. This is your savings. So you save $2,000 today and you're going to put $10,000 that's going to grow tax-free. So any money you earn, any income or profit you earn on this money, it's tax-free until you take it out when you retire. How much can you contribute? It changes per year. Uh, 2020 was 19,400. Now, if you are over uh, 65, uh, over 50, you will get 6,500, not over 65. Over 65, you're going to be taking the money out. Okay. So here, the employer can contribute and the employee will contribute. Usually, it is the employee, mostly the employee, but the employer can contribute. So, for example, you put 10%, they will match 5 or 6% of it. For example, my wife's company, I believe they match, match up to 5%. Okay? But remember this number, and it might change from year to year. There's always a max contribution. So for both employee and employer. So remember, the employee said, let's assume you're under under the age of uh, 50. You contribute. I believe they're going to change it this year to 20,000, 2021. But let's, we're working with 2020. So you can contribute 19,500. Let's assume your company contribute. The maximum your company can contribute is an amount that, that together they cannot exceed 57. Okay, they may they don't usually contribute, they don't match you 100%, but let's assume they want to match some employees and pay them more. The maximum is 57,000. Okay, any excess contribution must be the returns. Let's assume you contributed more, it must be returned to the employee by April 15, the following year, or be included in gross income. Okay, and you must meet all the qualification rule established for the pension and profit sharing plan, which is non discriminatory, you cannot favor one group, so on and so forth. Okay, now. 403B, I have, I keep saying I have, you know, if I want to participate in my company's and CCP retirement, we don't have 401, we have 403B. Usually they are for educational, educational organization and tax exempt organization. Same concept, different name. That's fine. Okay. A little bit more about 401k. Let's assume an individual is making 80,000, elected to contribute 3%. Well, they contributed 2,400. Now what happened is this, they shielded this money. This money is not not taxed now the 2400 is not taxed okay but if you take it out prematurely it's subject to taxation now on, on your w2 here's what happened for this individual um the wages and compensation which is box one it's going to be seventy seven thousand six hundred. okay however their social security and medicare will be eighty thousand the full amount is subject to social security and medicare and they will have two thousand four hundred reported in box 12 as retirement as a retirement uh, distribute retirement contribution not distribution okay now again you cannot take this money out you're subject to a penalty don't worry we're going to have a whole session about distribution um, unless you know the plan terminated um, you separated from your service you can transfer it and there's a certain way you have to do it death or disability uh, reaches obviously 59 and a half we need to talk about this or you experience hardship there are many reasons for this hardship and this hardship changes from year to year like when we when we go through a recession like when we go through the housing crisis in 2007 2008 they gave people the right to take some money out uh, during COVID, the same concept so the hardship could be for many many reasons 
okay there are special rules cost kiosk or cost plan okay these are for self-employed individual remember if you work for a company you might have a pension or you might have a 401k and remember under a pension you get could be profit sharing plan and under 401k it could be 403b but that's not the point what what happened if you're self-employed you're the company well you're subject to the same contribution and benefit limitation at the, as as a pension or profit sharing. So the same rules apply to you. You can contribute the lo you can contribute the lower of fifty seven thousand maximum is fifty seven thousand. Remember, you're the employee and the employer, or twenty five percent of your of your earned income. Again, it cannot it can you cannot you cannot contribute more than fifty seven. All in all, okay, the lower of these two. Okay, the purpose of the calculation, earned income cannot exceed 285,000. So if it exceeds 285,000, that's that's your maximum. You're going to see the computation in a moment. Earned income from self-employment is determined after deduction, one half of self-employment taxes. So what you do when, when we are making this determination of the 25%, your earned income times 25%, we have to deduct self-employment taxes and and after the amount of key contribution. You're gonna see in a formula in a moment. Actually, let's work an example. Sam is self-employed, his earning before the deduction, but after one half of self-employment. So after they paid the self-employment, they are left with 60,000. How do we con how do we compute the amount that they can deduct? Okay, well, here, here we go. We're gonna take the this amount after one half of self-employment minus 25 25 is the maximum percentage minus 25 percent of x we don't know how much you're contributing so it's whatever you have now after so the amount after you deduct your this is let me highlight it in yellow let me highlight it in yellow so the 60,000 oops the 60,000 is the amount highlight in yellow there we go so um this is after the deduction of one one half of self-employment so they're giving us this number then you now you're going to deduct your 25 percent of the amount after that which is you don't know the amount after the after the contribution therefore we call it x we're going to see what's the maximum so you just basically you solve for x and x is forty-eight thousand. therefore sam is entitled to fifty-seven thousand, the maximum or 25 percent of the amount after the contribution say the amount after the contribution is 40 48 25 percent of 48 is 12,000 so they can obviously uh, the lower of these two the maximum they can contribute is 12,000 which is 20 simply put what what does the 12,000 represent what does the 12,000 represent 12,000 represent the amount uh, 25 percent of the amount after after self-employment tax and after the maximum contribution the maximum contribution is 12000 therefore 60000 is the amount after self employment tax the maximum contribution is the maximum contribution is 12000 we'll come back to 48000 uh 48000 times 25% will give us back to 12000 so this is how it works now why 285000 why 285000 so let's assume earn, uh, your earnings after your earnings after taxes is uh, your earning after self-employment tax is 285,000. So let's do this quick calculation to show you this. So this is your this is your yellow number. Just let me highlight it in yellow. This is your yellow number and let's see what's going to happen now. If we take 285,000 minus 0.25x equal to your x equal to your contribution and if you solve this formula it's going to be 285,000 equal to 1.25x we add you know 0.25x on each side now we're gonna look for x we're gonna divide by 1.25 285,000 divided by 1.25 I divided both sides by 1.25 and that's gonna give me 228,000 now if you take 228,000 multiplied by the maximum amount that's going to give you 57 so this is how the number 57 come along comes comes about comes about so 285 you know you're going to come back after you do after you do this computation the maximum contribution is 57 therefore the lower of 57 and 57 is 57 so that's the maximum you can contribute okay 57 
Okay, so you know what's the maximum. Now we have two other plans that are kind of similar, so I'm gonna put them side by side. They're also for self-employed individual. One is called, not self-employed, small companies actually, sorry, but could be for self-employed, SAP could be for self-employed. One of them called Simplified Employee Pension and the other one called Simple. Although it's called Simple, it stands, you know, although it doesn't work quite good, the abbreviation, Savings and Incentive Match Plan for Employees, Simple, Simple Plan. So the Simple Plan versus SAP. SAP is for small business. The uh, simple plan is specifically for 100 uh, companies with fewer than 100 employees that does and does not qualify for pension or profit sharing plan. Okay, here SAP, the company will set up IRA account for each employee. So if you wanna have a SAP plan, that's fine. You're a small company, you don't want to pay, you know, all those pension. Here you can open either a 401k or an IRA, okay, for the employees. SAP, you can have stocks, bonds, mutual fund. You can have stocks, bonds, mutual fund. Okay, it stacks like a 401k. What does that mean? It means the money is not taxable. Uh, it's con it's funded with pre-tax money. It's funded, so the money that you put now, it's pre-tax and it grow tax-free until you're 59 and a half, until your distribution. Same thing for simple plan. They both, they both work the same way. Okay, here. Employer contribution only. SAP plan, only the employer contribute. It means the company contribute. You don't have to put money away. They can contribute between one and 25% and they have to contribute to everyone, okay? The simple plan, both the employee and the employer will contribute. The employee can contribute up to 13,500. Again, these numbers are for 2020. If you're listening to this recording in 2022, 2023, pay attention to the limitation. And if you are over 50, you can get an a kick off an additional 3,000 that's called catch up. The employer have two options here. The employer can contribute 2% or 3%. What is that 2% and what's that 3%? Well, we call the 2%, if they, if they go with the 2%, it's called non-elective. It means every, they have to contribute 2% to all employees. If they, if they go with the 2% option, if they go with the 3% option, they only, they would contribute only to the employees that participated in the plan. So if you don't participate in the plan, the company has a 3% elect, elective, they don't contribute anything to you. Whatever you want to contribute, they will open an IRA account for you. That's fine, or a 401k, but they will not finance it. You'll have to finance it if they go with the three, if they go with the, if they go with the three, if they go with the 3%, they only finance it if you participate, if they, sorry. Uh, yes, if they go with the 3%, if you don't participate, you don't get the 3%, okay? So simply put, if a, if a company has 10 employees, seven active and three not active, guess what? If they go with the 2%, all employees will get 2%. If they go with the 3% plan, only the seven active employees will, will, um, will get that additional money in the retirement account, okay? Um, for the simplified employee plan, the employee has to work three of the last five years and earn at least $600. They want to make it easy for employees to uh, to participate, okay? And when you do this comp the, the computation, you'll deduct your self-employment tax out of net earnings. So it's the earnings, again, you're back to the limit of $57,000 any way you, anyway you dice it, okay? Okay. Um, here you have to be under the simple plan, age 21, earn 5,000 in the last two years and expect to earn 5,000 in the current year to be able to participate and participate. This way it's worth it for the company to set up the account for you. Okay, again, as we said, the max is 57,000. The max is 57,000. And a lot of, um, lot of self-employed individual, they create a SAP plan for themselves. For example, I know my brother, he's a self-employed, he has his own company, he has his own, he, he has his own SAP plan. Okay, that's fine. You're the employee and you're the employer. And he's the only person in the company. Um, and uh, for simple plan, just one small rule is you have to be in the plan for two years before you can take money out without penalty. So let's assume you started with the company at age 58 and a half. And guess what? You're not going to be able to take any money until 60 and a half. So you have to be two years into the system, although the general rule is 59 and a half. Small trick for this, you have to be two years into the system. At the end of this recording, if you like this recording, please like it, share it, uh, uh, share it with others. And if you are studying for the CPA exam, I strongly encourage you to visit my website, farhatlectures.com. I don't replace your CPA review course. I can help you make the material easier, easier to understand so you can 
understand your CPA review course. Patrick, you can pass your exam. Good luck, study hard, and stay safe.